Emperor Claudius wrote his history of Etruria. No one bothered to recreate it because Romans did not want to have anything to do with Etruscans. Diodorus of Sicily, the way he justifies Romans conquering Greece without making them look like the bad guys. Alexander's mom, Olympias, was violated by Cassander. Mm. So what he does is yeah. kind of brilliant. What he does is he takes Cassander and says, Cassander went against everything Alexander stood for. So Olympias was fortified in the city of Pella, where mm -hmm. the palace was. And all of Cassander's army were surrounding the city of Pella. She sends in a bunch of assassins to go kill her. And they get to her room. And they, they sneak in the room and they see her. And she's, she's dressed in her Dionysian robe. And she has a diadem on her head. And she's looking all, looking glowing like the, like the queen she is. She's, the, she's Alexander's mother. And they see her and they drop to the floor. And they're, they're like, we're sorry, we're sorry, we're sorry. And they leave. So it was a failed attempt. They couldn't do it. They saw her and they immediately were like, I can't do this. He kills them. He sends an, another round of assassins to go find her. Same thing happens. They show up there, they see her, and they're like, oh no, forgive us. We're just doing what we're told. She goes, no, you were sent here to kill me and you're gonna kill me. She goes, I command you to do it. She, that's how she goes out. She just like went out like a G, like a gangster. It's mm -hmm. now, now the Greeks are the bad guys because Alexander's mother got murdered. Welcome back to the Gnostic Informant, and you are about to attain true Gnosis. And I'm joined again by Maximus Tominus. And uh, first of all, what, do you, what, is, what is on your hat? Make what a great again? Make Rome great again. Yeah, that's our main goal. It should be always our main goal. Yeah. You know, recreate the Roman Empire again. <laughs> nice. There was just there was some different continent. I don't know. It's some some other place I've never heard about. <laughs> uh so i just you know had to adjust it for you no that's funny that's make funny. rome great again i appreciate it last time you were um you were had you had the mask on and you were sort of going with the uh you know the uh behind the scenes approach but uh hey you're here now and you're uh and everyone you know at, we're, we're about to talk about the etruscans yeah i got a mask so is that really a relegans mask or is that that's a myth yeah, we were talking about how uh, a lot of uh, stuff that we heard here in uh, is is a myth in uh, in regarding Romans. This is a myth, unfortunately. Even you know, Kevlar masks were probably just uh, just just a great myth because you cannot see a shit. <laughs> you, you you just can't see. You you cannot defeat your enemy with your with these small small impractical eye holes. <laughs> it's it's just for uh, for a celebration or uh, you know when you are um, for for religious purposes probably, but right, right. Uh, you would not want to go to a battle. Yeah, can you imagine having this with, thing on your with head? this mask? Yeah, it's yeah. your head with a club and. Bang. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so, I mean you have you you see you see like this. Yeah, you, you cannot see it. You you won't see your enemy. No, <laughs> when yeah. when he comes from this way, you won't see him. At all, that'd be a bad idea. It's it's cool looking, and I assume that people during gladiator games they, they definitely use it, right? And for for uh, for shows and for religious purposes, but in a real battle, no. Right. Yeah. You probably just want to protect your skull, and that's pretty much it. Yeah. 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 So let's start off with these Etruscans. I want to get into some of these pre-Italic peoples a little bit but mostly the Etruscans, because that's sort of what you've been looking at recently. And uh, tell us about this this author. This Is he a, is he a scholar? Is he a what, archaeologist? What is he? Uh, he was a... Uh, uh, I need to find a book where I have it. He was uh, Werner, Werner Keller, I think it was, it was his name. I just, you know, stumbled across the book in a dusty bookshop. like, Etruscan, wow, I want to read about it. And I just found about the author. Uh, he was an anti-Nazi fighter. He was in a German counterintelligence, and he was just sabotaging Nazis throughout the war. Uh, they even arrested him. They was he was supposed to be executed, but they postponed the execution date till the end of the war. Then he was captured by the U.S. military, 
and he spent a good portion of his life in uh, in Italy. I think for 15 years he spent really in Italy and all the cool places he writes about in Etruria, he really visited those places and did the research uh, by himself. So this is the really, he he doesn't he does he didn't have a secondhand sources. He really uh, went down there and you know did did the research by himself. And he wrote this book about Ruskins and he pretty much bust some Roman myths that we Roman fans have about Romulus, about who found Rome and what was the influence of Etruscans on Rome. Nice. So tell us a little bit about some of these busted myths. Like, for example, we think that, so a lot of people get the idea that Livy, living in the first century BC, wrote this perfect, flawless story <laughs> about the founding of Rome, and it's 100% true. There was a guy named Romulus who had a brother named Remus, and they fought over these hills, and <laughs> what's, the, what's the real deal here? Yeah. I, I mean, I, it, it's just hard to talk about. I know a lot of people will just curse me right. <laughs> for saying this. There was no Romulus. <laughs> <laughs> Romulus uh, was fake. Uh, was was the next kings uh, Numa Numa Pompilius no. his successor uh, Tullus Hostilius and Ar Ancius Mart Marcius Ancus Marcius those four kings were prob probably never even existed and the first and he named the first Etruscan kings and he was his name was Tarquinus Priscus and he was Etruscan wow and yeah, yeah he and he basically says all Rome, Rome basically there were, there were these seven hills and there were just a couple of huts on those hills there was no city at all and only when Enturians came to control the city of Rome then it merged those seven hills those those tribes on those hills uh that had, that were of Latin descent accepted Etrurians as their masters because they were uh they were not really educated they, they they were just you know simple minded farmers and those Etruscan kings uh, came and uh, and uh, came to them and tell them, hey we're going to give you some of our culture we're going to make your lives better and you will accept us as your as your uh, ru rulers and they were like okay and there was yeah this is the beginning uh, of Rome because we we also have some archaeological evidence to prove this because 753 BC allegedly where Romulus founds uh, Rome is founded by Romulus we have a lot of archaeological evidence dating eighth uh, century BC ninth uh, century BC so there had al already been some uh, Population or some 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 uh, some inhabitants on in uh, in Rome long before uh, allegedly Romulus arrived there. Yeah, and I'm looking at this list. It's the seven original kings of Rome before the before the mm -hmm. before the uh, what's it called the Republic, and the fifth king is Tarquinius Priscus. Yeah. Now it says that he was of Etruscan origin, just like you said, and his mother was Etruscan. His father was actually from Corinthian, was it was a Corinthian Greek. Now this would explain. Now, like there might, this might not be true or not, but if if it is true, this would explain why Rome designed its um designed its government almost exactly like a mm -hmm. um Corinthian or Athenian the senators the the same type of like mm -hmm. the same republic basically that you'd see in greece all of a sudden rome has this so you, yeah. have, to, you have to you have to take into consideration there's got to be some influence from greeks but i think the culture not the government not the laws mm -hmm. the culture is purely etruscan that's what i think we can say without a doubt yeah yeah I mean, any Romans you would talk to during, uh, let's say, third century BC, and you would tell him uh, that he is an Etruscan or he is of Etruscan origin, he would probably want to kill you. Right. Because Romans 
Romans uh, loved Greeks, even though they conquered them. And I'm like, yeah, Greeks are, we are superior. Right. But Romans admired Greeks for many reasons. And even, and they despised, they despised Etruscans, which is really interesting because, because both Greeks and Etruscans had a, had a huge influence on Rome, but Romans totally neglected any any uh, influence they had from from uh, from Etruscans because Etruscans were too uh, feminine. Right. They were they were too equal equality orientated, and they were not great warriors as no. Greeks once once were. So yeah, we, we're influencing yo. Know, I really want to talk about it. you know Claude, Claude, uh, Emperor Claudius his, yeah. his uh, famous book about Etruscans. He loved the Etruscans. Yeah, he loved Etruscans. In he wrote he was the only he was the only Roman that wrote, wrote only about Etruscans. Most of the ro- sources that we have about Etruscans are from oh, yeah. just you know passing mentions from Levy because uh, when they were uh, at war with uh, with Romans. But uh, when uh, when uh, Claudius was writing his books, his history of Etruria, that got lost. Why would it, why was it lost? Because no one bothered to to recreate it. Because you know every I don't know 100, 100, 200 years, you need to rewrite those those scripts, uh, those those scriptures, uh, and. Emperor Claudius wrote his history of Etruria, and no one bothered, no one bothered to recreate it because Romans did not want to have anything to do with Etruscans because they were, you know, for them they were pathetic, and you know it's it's just sad. It's just sad that it does happen. But uh, yeah. we think that uh, the book from Claudius, from Emperor Claudius, uh, got lost because of. You know, Middle Ages and so on. Now it was probably lost already during the uh, in the Roman Empire because Romans did not want to hear about the truth of uh, influence of Etruscans on 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 Rome. Right, and you know, I'm thinking too about the um, about how Diodorus of Sicily, who I've been on, a, I've been reading his uh, English translation of his works. Mm. And uh, he wrote a lot. He wrote like a Bible. It's actually, actually, believe it or not, it was called the Bibliotheca. So mm. this, this was the Bible before the Bible. And he starts off with the gods, talks about Zeus and Saturn and all these, you know, he gets into Egypt and all those gods. And anyways, his whole story progresses all the way through Alexander the Great, all the way to Caesar. His, he wrote a large, his probably more than Josephus wrote. Mm. Anyways, when he gets into the, that he when he starts talking about the Romans, you can tell because he just he just before before he gets to the Romans, he's talking about Alexander the Great and how great the Greeks are, how great Alexander was, and the Diadachi Wars. But the the way he the way he portrays and and um I'm trying to think of the word to explain this. The way he sort of justifies that's the word. The way he justifies Romans conquering Greece without making them look like the bad guys is he talks about yeah with the, he talks about how uh alexander's mom olympias was violated by um uh what's it who was it uh cassander mm. so what he does is yeah. kind of brilliant what he does is he takes cassander and says cassander went against everything alexander stood for and murdered the wife of olympias i'll tell the story real quick it's a great story so Olympias was was um, fortified in the city of Pella, where mm-hmm. the palace was, and all of Cassander's army were surrounding the city of Pella, and they were asking her to to um, give herself up. She wouldn't do it. She goes, "No, I'm a, I'm a Macedonian queen. We don't give up." So, anyways, she sends in a bunch of assassins to go kill her, and they get to her room, and they they sneak in the room, and they see her, and she's she's dressed in her. Dionysian robe and she has a diadem on her head and she's looking all looking glowing like the like the queen she is she's the, she's Alexander's mother and they see her and they drop to the floor and they're, they're like we're sorry we're sorry we're sorry and they leave so it was a failed attempt 
They couldn't do it. They saw her and they immediately were like, I can't do this. Hmm. So then they, so then they go back to Cassander. I think he kills them. He sends an, another round of assassins to go find her. Same thing happens. They show up there. They see her and they're like, Oh no, mother. Don't, 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 don't be, let us, or, uh, forgive us. We're just doing what we're told. She goes, no, you were sent here to kill me and you're going to kill me. She goes, I command you to do it. So they, so they do it. So that's how she, that's how she goes out without, without, without complaining, without crying, without like, she just like went out like a G, like a gangster. And, uh, so the way Diodorus of Sicily shifts the story and the narrative is Mm -hmm. now, now the Greeks are the bad guys because Alexander's mother got murdered. So the Romans come in and save the day as the new hegemony of the West. Yeah, it's typical of Romans. Yeah. They sometimes they need to justify, you know, conquering Greece. But sometimes when it comes to Etruria, they didn't did not really need some justification for conquering Etruria. They were just weak, weak people. But what you what you said about uh Cassandra, was her name? Cassandra. 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 Uh you know, uh oh, oh, I just forgot her name. What uh, a rape of Lucretia. Oh yeah. Yeah, you know you know the story how you know let me tell uh, let me tell you the the, the whole story real quick, real yeah. quickly. Uh there was this was the last Roman king Tarquinius Superbus which means Superbus Superbus means arrogant and he was actually one of the greatest kings Rome ever ever had. He even he even built a temple of Jupiter which was the first probably a real building uh, Rome had at the time, uh, except for uh, Circus Maximus, but that was just a hole in the ground. And, and yeah, it was, it was just, a, I mean, if you look, look up the, look up the, how Circus Maximus looked like, it did not look in, in the eighth century, it was just a hole in the ground. And, right. uh, and the Roman forum was called forum Boarum, which means a, like a big forum. They, they were, were, it was a forum for uh, people who sold who sold pigs. Yeah, so he was the uh, Tarquinius Superbus was the first real king, but uh, he had his arrogant son. I think he he had the same name Tarquinius as well, and he forced himself upon a Roman woman. Uh, her name was Lucretia. Right, and he raped her basically. And uh, Lucrezia told it to her to her husband, and uh, her uh, upon when when she told him, "Hey, I was I was violated by uh, by king's king's son." Uh, she stabbed herself to death. She she committed suicide because she, and she she said, "Hey, I don't want to be an excuse for other Rom- Roman women." when they are uh when they break their vows to their husbands which is it, it, it is a strange story but it underlines how roman women were situated at, at the time absolutely and what is interesting about this is that we talk about influence of etruscans on rome he the the, uh, the husband of, of lucretia was the first Roman consul, um, uh, along with uh, Mark uh, uh, Lucius Lucius Unius Brutus. These two guys were the first consuls of Rome, and they were both Etruscan. Wow! And, the, and this totally, I was like, it makes sense. Yeah, they were the. Ma- yeah, I thought of them. They, they were Romans, but I read somewhere that uh, Brutus was nephew of the. Uh, of the deposed Tarquinius Superbus, who, who was an Etruscan. So logically, Brutus was Etruscan as well. But we just, you know, we tend to neglect the facts. And we, you know, we sometimes think, oh, you know, 509 BC, uh, revolution of Romans against Etruscans. No, it was not a revolution of Romans against Etruscans. It was revolution of uh, uh, Etrusc- Etruscans against their king. 
they wanted to depose the king and they wanted to find uh, a new republic. And this is what happened. Etruscans found themselves a new republic and Romans were, at the time, they were just these farmers slash warriors and they did not have anything to do with it at the time. So there is that is another you know myth that I needed to bust and it's unfortunately it's really it's true yeah yeah and another thing about these Etruscans that I really I really think that people should understand about them is they had they were brilliant artists mm -hmm. so this is a mm -hmm. this is a goddess named Katha she was a lunar deity purely Etruscan and her her consort believe it or not is a god known as Dis Potter. So mm, Dis, mm. Dis Potter is a, so this is, this is the reason why I'm bringing this up is to show like who these people actually are. They're, these are the real natives of the Italian peninsula. They're not, they didn't come from the Phoenician expansion in the West. They didn't come from, they're not like the Greeks. They are, they are really European people. I think now there's some, there is some debate about this. It might be a mix of Greek and European peoples, but the reason why I bring that up is Dis Potter. That name is one of the is probably the oldest god of all in the world that we know about. It means God. It means Sky Father. So mm -hmm. you can see, and the, and the reason why we know this is the oldest god in the world is because Dias Potter. All you do is add an e. Dias Potter is the ancient god of India and even parts of China. So this. Whoa. These proto indo european peoples that started off, they're called the Yamana culture, and then they turned into the Cordwayer peoples, and they spread out around, right around the area of the Black Sea. So you have the Black Sea area, and they spread all in all different directions. And this god, Dis Potter, I mean, Sky Father, it's, it's a proto indo european language. You see him in Italy, in Spain, and you also see him in China and in India, hmm. which is like, it's like, Full proof that we know that this that these people are the almost ancient people in the, in the, on the continent. The reason why I bring that up is because Jupiter is a. If you say Dis Potter a hundred times fast, you're going to end up saying Jupiter, Dis Potter, Jupiter. So Dias Potter becomes Ju Potter, and then Jupiter is like that's the god of the Roman mythology, and he's Zeus, Zeus Potter. That's another way to say it. Or Jove it becomes Jove. So this is like the oldest god that we know is Jupiter. Mm -hmm. And he's Etruscan. Yeah, this is the thing with the with the Etruscan language that no one has ever been able to translate it, even though we have a uh, Billinger text, you know, like uh uh they found they found Etruscan uh Etruscan writings, and you know, there was this translation in Latin. The problem was that the Latin translation is uh, or is not literal, so it's just you know taken away from the context. So we don't know the the precise words. Even two thousand years, two thousand five hundred years after, we are not able to crack the language. And it is interesting that many Romans were not able to do that as well. Romans were not able really to deal with Etruscan. Etruscan language is such a such a unique language. I mean, here in Europe we have uh, we have uh, Finnish language, we have uh, uh, Hungar uh, Hungarian language, which are really strange because they do not have any uh, similar connection. They don't have any, any connections to any other language, but they are connected uh, to one another, which is strange. You know, Hungary is in the central Europe. Finland is uh, in uh, Northern Europe, but they are connected somehow. Etruscan language has no counterpart anywhere. Just, you know, yeah. there is no language that uh, has ever been recorded that is anything like an Etruscan language, which is why I think, or well, not only my opinion, but this is the reason why Etruscans never managed to conquer uh you know became the great conquerors because of the language because no one understood them yeah now if you look at this if you look closely at this what what you get what you what you end up seeing is something that looks it looks like it's almost proto-european language like it looks yeah. like i don't know if you've ever seen like runes or like 
ancient European like symbols and they resemble that. But it also has a it also looks like a little bit of Phoenician. Like if, if you could like, so what I, this is my hypothesis, and I've heard other people say this too, that the Etruscan alphabet is a product of centuries of of, of a clash of European people and th- like maybe Phoenician settlers. So you got this Phoenician alphabet that looks very similar to this. I'll pull it up real quick. And but it doesn't it's not the same. You can t- you can tell it's not the same. But if you look at if you look at the European the Proto-European code, this the Proto-European script, whatever you want to call it, alphabet or whatever, it looks like Etruscan. So it looks like for basically what I'm what I'm getting at is it almost seems like there is a combination. I, sorry, I didn't mean to put that up. It looks like there's a combination between this, here, this, this is Phoenician, and if you look mm-hmm. at it, it looks sort of similar. Mm-hmm. But the European script has the same sort of like the way the 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 way this the way the symbols are were like sort of the font, I guess you would call it. It looks like a European language. Is what it looks like. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I agree. It, it, I mean, it's not like it doesn't look like a Chinese language. You you can read it. Yeah. It C looks like a C. All those letters look same, like the letters that we know. The problem is that we have no freaking idea what those words sometimes mean. We are able to crack some words, so one would say. And, you know, if we know this word, maybe you know we can derive from from this word. The whole sentence is no, and you know it just baffles me how the greatest minds of the twenty first century are still not able to crack that language. Yeah, and so there's actually there's actually some charts that are made, and I'll show you one right now. This is how they break it down. It's not this simple though. There's a lot of debate over this, so this is not like. This isn't a fact that I'm about to show you, but a lot of people put it like this. So you get this early Proto-Indo-European script, and it branches out into Hellenic, Celtic, Italic. So, so uh, Etruscan would be like somewhere in between Hellenic and maybe Celtic or Italic. It'd be like in the middle of those. Mm-hmm. And, it's bit, and that's exactly what it looks like. It looks like it's a combination of both, which shows you that it probably was a result of the two cultures clashing. And yeah, so mixing together. Yeah, but yeah. yeah fascinating though, it is it is it is. But uh, for Etruscans, it was it was a backbone of their of their uh, culture, their freaking language. They were so skillful. They were they were not great warriors, but they were great uh, sailors. You know, and uh, Greeks call them pirates. I mean, they. They either call them, uh, I think the, the word for I'm uh, looking for is uh, Tyrrhenians, not Etruscan, yeah. this is a Roman term. Yeah. They call themselves uh, Racena, term no one uses. Why? Because Etruscans lost. They, they, do, not get to, they do not get to call them uh, call their own nation by, uh, by their name. Uh, oh, excuse me. Uh, so, so yeah, uh, Etruscans were great at many things, but unfortunately, the language the language limited their possibilities to expand their culture. Uh, so they were pretty much landlocked in uh, northern Italy. They tried to expand south to Capua to uh, to cities in the south. Pompeii was an uh, was the Etruscan city, yeah, and Rome was pretty crucial because it was a bridge between Etruria and uh, southern Italy, right? And Rome was pretty crucial f- for them. And when Romans started to expel Etruscans, then the whole the whole Etrurian castle just you know went down. Yeah, and then you sort of. So, the, like, the Bronze Age is sort of like a, it's such a deep mystery of how to put the puzzle pieces together because we just have, there's no writing, there's no, like, records. It's all archaeology. Mm. And, and then you start getting into the, 
sort of after that, like the ages after that, you get into like the 500, 600 BCE, which is like founding of Rome time. And you start to see like, they say like Pythagoras uh, travels from, from Iona. He's from Samos, which is, which is an Ionian. It's like off Turkey. And he, he settles in the uh, Southern boot, basically of Italy, which is, um, what was the name of that city? Patmos. Oh, no, not Patmos. Um, what is it again? Uh, uh, Sicily? No. Syracuse? Syracuse? It's, no. It's right near there. Let me just look it up real quick. Pythagoras. Did he, okay, so he ends up going to... Well, they called it Magna Gratia at the time. but it, Yeah, yeah, Magna Gratia. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. But it's like the southern, it's like the end, it's like the bottom of Italy, like the right where the boot is, but not the island. Yeah. Not Italy. But that's, but that's what, basically what I'm getting at is like, that's where the Greeks start to come in from that area. And then they start to populate the upward. But, but by that time, if you looked at Rome or the region of Rome, the greater Roman area, it would be all Etruscans. Hmm. Yeah, that's true. Romans were... The first, I think Rome emerges in the in the fifth century, or, or late fifth century, early fourth century. Basically, when Gauls sack Rome, this is when I would say Rome's history begin. Yeah, uh, yeah. What I mean, uh, what what is his name? Uh, Fur Fur Furious Camillus. I think you might have heard of him, the second founder of Rome. Uh, yeah, the, the story real quick is that Gauls suddenly they cross the Alps and they s just start sacking everything, uh, including Etruria. And Romans want to meet them head on, but they are defeated in, I think, a 390 BC in the Battle of Aelia, uh, Aelia River, and they are just crushed. They are defeated and Rome and uh, Rome has no soldiers defending its walls. So Gauls march in, uh, march right into Rome and sack it, and they sack it for many, many days. They are not able to conquer the whole Rome, though. There is a on, on Capitoline Hill. There is a, still a garrison holding out, but uh, yeah, the fact is Rome uh, Gaul was Gaul Gauls conquered Rome in uh, either in 390 or I think 387 uh, BC. And this is where Rome almost ends. So Rome's, uh, well, they kind of need to, some, they, they need, need some new dictator. They, they need a new guy, and his, his name is Furious Camillus, who had been expelled, actually, I, I don't know, 10 years prior to these events, because he was sentenced for embezzling money. So they suddenly go to him to his villa in somewhere in the in the countryside and say, "Hey, you know, we we were defeated by ghosts and we, we would really appreciate your help." So he goes and he sometimes it's claimed that he defeated Gaul. He did not defeat him. He, uh, he did not defeat him, but he talked some sense into the Romans who wanted to. They want to actually abandon Rome and start a new city uh, in. Veii, which was uh, which was an Etruscan city, a huge enemy of Rome. They had been fighting one another for almost 100 years. Romans conquered the city uh, 10 years prior before the before the Battle of Alia uh, against Gauls. And suddenly, when Rome Rome was destroyed, Romans were like, eh, "Why should we start a new city? Why why should we rebuild? Why should we rebuild Rome?" You know, we have this way I we have we have this nice uh, cozy city. You know, they just moved there, and Furious Camillus was actually responsible for talking sense to them and said, "Hey, this is not a Roman way. We need to rebuild our city. We need to rebuild Rome." So here's the he is the second founder of Rome for uh, talking sense to to the to the Romans. Yeah, and so uh, if you look at like a the map of pre-republic italy you'll see it's divided up in the north and the northwest it's the etruscans and they're almost in france like they're part like mm. they're, 
they're well, they're up there. But also to the to the east of them are these Sabines or Umbrians. So they sort of two different people sort of in the same region. And um and I think it's like these are there's like these people who end up becoming Latins, basically. The the combination of all these different type of tribes. And if you actually look at like their culture, this is what I like to look at. I like to look at their culture. The religion tells us so much about people. Look at their religion. You'll see what they you'll see who they are, who influenced them. And the the list of their deities, they have Apollo is one of their gods, this Potter, um, you know, like the moon is the moon goddess, maybe it has a different name in both in both categories. But the the pantheon is very similar. And um Demeter is actually one of the Demeter is actually one of the Sabine gods. And I just think it's so the reason why I'm bringing that up is because we, so the the founding the founding myth tells us that the uh, Romulus defeated the Sabines and then Curinus was an ancient god of the Sabines who they rename as Romulus. So you see two mythologies get put together into one, and that becomes mm-hmm. it becomes Roman mythology. But it's really it's really from two different it's really Etruscan and Sabine mythology put together into one. Mm. It's inter- interesting because, uh, for example, for Etruscans, uh, they were they were really stuck in mythicism, uh, and for Greeks, uh, the important was philosophy, and you know, mythicism and philosophy they do not match. Right, and this is why Etruscans and Greeks fought one another. They really hated one another, and this is when Romans conquered Greeks and they adopted they adopted adapted their culture they started uh, hating etruscans as well even though they had a good portion of their history were joined was joined with, uh, with etruscans yeah that's a good point is because and actually cicero wrote a wrote a book about this hmm. cicero wrote a book called on the nature of the gods and what he does is he takes a stoic greek philosopher and a and a myth believer like someone who actually believes these roman mythology myths very dogmatic very religious um devout believer in these ancient myths and he writes a platonic dialogue like plato it's like reading plato and he's two they're going back and forth arguing over these gods and what they mean and so cicero understood the dichotomy between these two schools of thought the philosophers who didn't take these myths as literal they're not literally true but they have a deeper meaning and they t- teach you how to do your, they teach you virtue and, and morals and principles. Whereas the other side was like, no, we have to pray to these guys. We have to give offer, we have to offer sacrifice. We have to give our firstborn. We have to do this and that and the third. So like Cicero makes a really clever conversation between these two people. It's a really, there's a translation in English by Oxford. Mm-hmm. Pretty good. Yeah. I mean, yeah. I need to get deeper into that. You know, as you mentioned, sometimes uh, when we were supposed to have a, you know, about Christianity and and so forth, uh, this yeah. guy who wrote also about Etruscans wrote also a book about Bible. It, it, it is uh, his the most famous work that he wrote, and his it's called the Bible was right eventually. Or the Bible was right, and it's about the historicity. In the Bible, that all events described in in Bible are historically true, or he goes, or you know, what what can be proved, right? He he proves that it, that it really really happened in the Middle East. It's good. But that's interesting. I do that a lot in my channel. I like to I like to explore the history of biblical narratives, and sometimes we find that. If they're not even sometimes it's not necessarily that they're like 100 like true exactly how it's written but there's a truth beneath the narrative so like mm-hmm. i'll just give an example i believe that you know the t- story of the tower of babel so you get this story that everyone's building this giant tower and uh, all of a sudden god was like you know what i don't want them to build this tower anymore i'm going to spread them all out of the world And they're all gonna have, not gonna understand. Well, I don't think that literally happened that way. But what I do think probably happened was you have this Sumerian culture 
who was like the world mm -hmm. empire. And there's a lot of people living there, all speaking under one tongue. And they all sort of branch out into their own colonies. And I think that sort of explains a time period. So that's just one example. And I think that to bring it, to bring it back to the Etruscans is like, I think that when we look at history, and I think that even when we look at Etruscan mythology, when I when I read when, when I when I try to gather what these stories are, even though there's nothing written about them, but like we can see from like depictions, like we have depiction of Dis Potter and the goddess, and so you sort of look in between, and it sort of tells a story of who these people are. So that even if mythology isn't true, it's still true in another, and it's still true in the sense that. It was put together to tell a story for a reason. Yeah, yeah. but for, for Romans, their only reason was to conquer new lands. Right. Unlike the unlike the Etruscans. Uh, Etruscans were really, I would say, spiritual. Yeah, they were very spiritual people. Very, very spiritual. And uh, they did not care much about you know conquering new territories. They cared about trade because they... Uh, their manufacturing system was just one of the best in Italy at the time. Rome at the time had nothing. And even when Romans conquered uh, Etruria, they did not adapt everything the Et uh, Etruscans had to offer. Romans were either, either farmers or warriors. And there was nothing in between. Yeah. Etrurians were... Uh, they had this artistic craftsmanship, uh, ceramics. They had a lot of gold and silver, actually. Actually, for Romans, gold they had no gold and silver. They were they were poor as hell uh, in the uh, in the beginning. I would say till the end of the third Punic War, uh, third, third century BC. Yeah, and this is what. Uh, for for example, for Romans, for really those ancient Romans, uh, it was deemed inappropriate to wear golden rings. The only people who could wear golden rings were ambassadors because they would they would look stupid in when in foreign country. Everyone is in everyone is wearing golden rings, and they had, they have nothing. But for typical Romans, even senators. They wore uh, iron rings because just there was no gold in Rome. It was something what a uh, degenerate would wear. Yeah. So Romans were, you know, really tough. They did not eat meat. They did not care about craftsmanship. They did not care uh, care about ceramics. They did not give a damn about anything that was not either connected to farming or conquering new lands, which was really an opposite of those craftsmen in Etruria. Yeah. This is actually Etruscan. Yeah. And I think when you look at something like this, it's like these people were advanced. Like, look at, think about this. Can you, even today, if you had the resources, do you think you could make that? I don't think I can. No, no. This is ancient stuff. And how, how old is it? Is it written anywhere? How old is it? I think this is like 700 BC or something like that. 700 BC. Yeah. They were, they were like, I, whoever was in Rome at the time could not probably, I don't know, they, they, they were eating with their bare hands probably at the time. Right. So, and they were eating with their bare hands 500 years after. So it, it's only when I think during the reign of Augustus, uh, 27 BC, it is when Romans start thinking, they start, start to think more about, hey, shouldn't we we be more crafty shouldn't we like build things because augustus emperor the first emperor augustus said about rome how how awful rome actually is in compar in comparison with uh, alexandria and antioch and other ancient uh, cities yeah so they they were really good at making these cisterns hmm. i'm not sure if they're what they're using this for maybe making wine because these are these are you can store stuff in these things I would say that it has to it has to have some religious meaning. Uh, yeah, maybe. I would. They would not waste so much resources and time on making something that is not uh, of uh, for 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 uh, religious purposes. 
And another thing that I noticed, and I've talked to scholars about this too, is there's a there's a clear connection, I think, with these with the Etruscan mythology and even influencing Christianity, which hold, oh. hold up, pump the brakes because Christianity is a Jewish religion. Yes, and but it also has it also progressed over time, especially with the church. And so there is a group called the Simonians. You ever heard of these people? Simonians. Yeah, yeah. I, I heard. Yeah. And so they Simonians are, are are a Christian sect from the first century, late first century, early second century. And then they got their name off Simon Magus. So the Simonians were a sect. So if you look at the early church, for example, Va Valentinus was taught from Clement, who was taught from Paul. He was third in succession from Paul. You have St. Linus, Italian bishop, who learned, who got directly anointed by Peter himself, which means he's the second pope. Now, anyways, there's a lot of these backstories. You can read Irenaeus. You can read Hipp Hippolytus. They tell you the whole story. Eusebius also has a breakdown of how the church became. But anyways, Simon Magus, you know who Simon Magus is, right? Yeah, yeah. Sort of a, an odd fellow, sort of a a weirdo, sort of like a kind of a hip, kind of a, um, what do you call him? So he's sort of a um, her heretic. Yeah. He's yeah, not yeah. following. The, he's, he's, he's up to no good. Well, he had his own sect of Christian, apparently. This is, and I got, this is for Hippolytus. It's, it's in a book called Refutation of All Heresies. If anyone wants to look this up and double check what I'm saying, it's called Refutation of All Heresies by, by Hippolytus. He says that these Simonians who learned Christianity from Simon Magus traveled to Rome. And this is a Etruscan god named Simon Sinkus. And so they found this. This is on the, um, there's, an, there's an island in Rome. I forgot what it's called, but it's, an, it's a little tiny island in the Tiber. The mm -hmm. Tiber River has an island in it. And they, this is where they located. They found this particular statue of Simon Sinkus. It's a Etruscan god that was mm -hmm. standing. And they, re since the name was Simon, it was so close to Simon, they said, that's Simon Magus. They didn't cross it off, but they just pretended that it said Simon Magus, basically. So they, so what they did was they, they made, the, and si by the way, Simon Sankus is part of a trin trinity of gods of the Etruscans. The Etruscans had a trinity. So what the, what the Simonians did was they said, okay, the Simonians or the, the Etruscans thought they had the true trinity. But what they really didn't know was their the real trinity was Jesus, Simon Magus, and God the Father. So they had their own trinity of Simon Magus being the highest. And they put this is how her, this is how heretical they were. They put Simon oh. Magus above Jesus. So I now, mean, yeah, Hippolytus, yeah. Hippolytus is writing his uh, refutation. He's like, these are a bunch of heretics. Don't listen to them. They're not. <laughs> So just some, just to clear that up, they're not. This is, doesn't represent Christianity, but it's a true story. Yeah. It's a true story. Yeah, I mean, if you go watch my latest latest videos, is why Christianity became viral. Is one of the reasons why uh, it was so easy to adapt Christianity in the fifth and uh, in the fifth and in the fourth century. It was because Christianity just went and started cherry picking whatever uh, other religions had to offer you so yeah. they just somehow adapted it yeah and they were not they were not these uh you know for this uh, ferocious religion that you know suppressed everyone and you know just burn wishes no nothing like that they they just got accepted by consent in the great into into the system and they were say, so great at adapting habits some other religions had, had to offer. So you suddenly found that what you do, some religious pagan rituals that you always that you have always done, and suddenly you found out that Christians do them too. And right, you are well. You can call yourself a Christian now because it's, yeah. it's, it's no, it's really a no difference. Well, that's what was so appealing about Christianity to these Romans because. All it required from you was just to have faith. It didn't ask you to do anything. You didn't mm -hmm. even, it's, it, it says you should get baptized. But Paul, 
Paul says you really don't have to get baptized. Get baptized in the spirit. Or mm. circumcision? Yeah, you probably shouldn't do it. But you don't have to. Get circumcised mm. in the heart. So it's all spiritual. It's all about like, so Paul even says, hey, listen, you might be hanging out in Greece. You might be in Macedonia. Let's say you're in Macedonia. This is in Paul's epistles. He says, if you're in Macedonia and you're hanging out with a bunch of pagans and they, 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 they offer a, a sacrifice to a pagan idol, to Zeus, and you're a Christian, you don't believe in this, are you allowed to eat that meat? Paul says, yes. Don't. He says, who cares? Their mythology is not real. So it has no power over you. Eat the meat. Go to the party. Have a, have a good time. Be merry. Be fruitful. Just have faith. So that's why Christianity was so appealing, because it doesn't ask you to do anything except for just go along with it. And that's how you get all these her, her, a lot of heretics, too. For example, I, I know you want to say something, but let me just finish this thought real quick. There's a group called the Nassines, N-A-S-S-E-E-N-E-S. And this is also in Hippolytus' reputation to all heresies. He talks about these Nassines. They're living in Alexandria, Egypt. And they thought that Jesus was every God. They thought that, so there's, I'll give you an example. There's a myth called, this is a Homeric hymn to Attis. This is from like 400 BC. I don't know, something like that. But anyways, they took this hymn and they crossed off the name Attis and put Jesus on there. So they said, blessed, you're the son of Kronos. Egypt calls you Osiris. Uh, you're Dionysus. You're Adonis. They're saying that Jesus, that all those people who thought they were worshiping Adonis, Dionysus, and Osiris, they were really worshiping Jesus the whole time. It was Jesus the whole time. So they, what they did was they made a universal syncretism religion based in Alexandria, Egypt. And like, and but there's actually some truth behind it because if you look at the Eucharist, there's a, in the Egyptian Book of the Dead, Osiris tells you, if you want resurrection, eat my flesh and drink my blood. So you got to wonder, is Christianity the true universal religion? I think it is. Yeah, when, this is so interesting when you think about uh, how spiritual Romans, the, the late Romans were. Right. You know, St. Augustine and uh, St. Cyprian, when they were writing about uh, Jesus and so on. And this is such a striking comparison uh, with, uh, with the early Romans. Right. They they took nothing from the spiritual Etruscans. The only I think uh I would say that the only god the early Romans actually thought that it's, it's vital was uh, I think it was Mars like the uh, god of god of war. Mars, right? Yeah. Yeah, he's Etruscan too. Mars, yeah. Mars is Etruscan. He's on the list of the Etruscan pantheon. Yeah, but he was the, he was the only god, uh, he, only god Romans took seriously. Yeah, there was no other. And like I said, they were farmers. They were other farmers. They were like uh, on on their land, or they were killing inhabitants of Italy. They had nothing. And it's so weird that this nation. It's so great at the same time because they were because this uh, under this system they could conquer the whole almost the whole Europe and Northern Africa. Africa and uh, Middle East, because they were these barbarians. They were used to uh, listening orders, and they had no, basically, no free, free thinking. Early right. Romans. This is when, uh, and thanks to that, they were able to conquer uh, so much, so much land. But when they started thinking about gods, about religion, then I think it kind of developed their senses. And they started to say, hey, why should we conquer more land? What, what, what's the purpose, purpose of it? And this is when Rome starts to stagnate. It's already during the era of Augustus. Absolutely. And when they start building colosseums, when they start building a pantheon. Temples. This is, this is uh, th th these temples when, when Rome becomes what, we, what, uh, what it is today. It is when... Romans do not have that fierce warrior spirit they used to have uh, as they, when they were fighting uh, Etruscans. Because for, for Etruscans, they were total barbarians. Yeah, and you know what? So you're, you're, what you're saying is absolutely true. If you, if you look at the timeline, so if you, if you actually think about it, 
if you grow up, let's say you grow up in a, in a family where you have a, it's you and your brother and you're fighting all the time and you get into real brawls in the streets with your brothers and your cousins and you're, you're always fighting all the time. Well, you're going to grow up to be like a tough fighter type of person. The, in the case of the Romans, they had the, they had the Carthaginians always at war with the Carthaginians for hundreds of hundreds of years. It hardened them. Then they had to defeat Hannibal. Then they had to defeat the Greeks and they had to defeat the Celts and they had to, so it made them into this hardy warrior type of culture. But then it got when it, so in this line, and it's like a progression all the way down to Augustus, Caesar, Pompey, civil war, Mark Antony and Augustus, civil war. And then finally, there's nobody there to fight against Rome. What does Augustus do? He dedicates 70 temples across the Roman Empire. 70. Brand new religion. Rome becomes a theocracy almost. He starts impl- implementing these religious laws like you better get married, you better have children, you better you better do your vows. And and that set, what that does is that's, that it creates a soil for Christianity to be ripened and grow right out of. And then you end up with this sort of new world that's like very spiritual, very, very religious based. And, and then, and then, and then you're right. If you look at the timeline, by the time Christianity becomes the state religion of Rome in the fourth century, you can see a decline of the empire as a imperial, imperial dynasty. It, now they're getting sacked by the Goths. Now mm. they're the ones on defense mode, right? I mean, uh, I just can't think of the who's the British writer, one of the first who wrote about the decline, uh, the rise and decline of of Rome, uh, Edward Gibbon, and he claims something what what is absolutely true that, that empires are like humans; they are young, they, they they progress, they get older, and they eventually die. And there is no way to prevent it. So Rome was early. Rome was the uh, at a stage of being these fearsome warriors who conquered lands, but they were kind of, you know, simple-minded people who did not think twice about I think neither religion nor about culture, about anything for them. Anything important was to kill kill every uh, everyone who is not Roman, right. but of course. Mongolians were, you know, Genghis Khan, and uh, he was also this barbarian that conquered other uh, other nations. But problems with problem with these empires is, is that they tend to collapse pretty quickly. Right. When the king dies, then bam, the whole empire is gone. I don't know. Uh, yeah, but Romans had their warriors face that kind of progress to this uh, philosophical stage where they man- maintained what they conquered. They gave other nations their culture. Right. Uh, I mean, they were uh, their laws and they, they created laws, uh, aqueducts, roads. A lot of these things had also a militaristic background. I mean, Romans did not build, build roads for you to get from point A to point B faster. No, it was a, the only purpose for, for of roads were to for their legions to march faster. That was the main reason. But Romans managed to get from the uh, warrior phase to um, I wanna how, how would I how would you call it uh, thinking phase thinking phase yeah yeah philosophical phase Ph- philosophical phase. When they stopped being those those warriors, and uh, yeah, this is where yeah, this is this this is so important for the empire to survive, and it is so important that this happened for Rome because they, thanks to that, they managed to live one thousand and how how much five four hundred years five hundred years depends so, on depends on how you wanna. There's a, there's, I think there's ages. I think it's like, so I think the empire is an age, and then you got the imp- imperial dynasty, and you have the Christian era. But like Rome as an entity, I'd say a thousand years. Yeah. 
So 1,000 years, and they would not, when they remain philosophers their whole time, we would not care about him. Yeah. Uh, and, and if they remain warriors, then their empire would collapse, like like Mongoli- Mongolian Empire. It did not last long. Right. And it ends up getting absolved into the Chinese dynasty or whatever, even the Ottomans, Ottoman Empire sort of sort of scoops up half of that empire and you get the Turks that jump in there. The Turks yeah. sort of are descend from the Mongolian type of race. And so, but like you said, and, and what you see with the Mongolians is some similar to what you saw with Alexander. Alexander conquers the entire civilized world. And when he dies, all of a sudden you have Seleucids, you have Bac- Bac- Bactrian kingdom, you have the Indians, you have the Greeks, you have the Ptolemies, the Antigonids and the Thracians, and you have all it just, it just splinters off into all these different groups. Mm. But they all sort of come out of this Alexandrian era. But same thing with, with the Mongolians. Genghis Khan sweeps through the east, sweeps through Russia, sweeps through Europe and Asia and Persia. And then when he dies, all of a sudden you have that kingdom gets divided up into his four sons. And then you have these Turks, then you have these Chinese, then you have these Persians, and then you have all, but they all come out of that era. And so that's just how it is. But like, but like, but like you said, with the Romans, it's a little bit different. Like you sort of see, okay, um, Pompey the Great conquers the whole entire East. He conquers all of, all of Turkey. He gets Syria. He gets Jerusalem. And then he dies in civil war. And, but Caesar holds that together. And then, and then now you have this like dynasty of Caesars that hold this area together. They sort of keep it the same. They sort of keep the identity of Rome intact for hundreds of years, which is like mm. very hard to do. Like you said, usually after maybe one son, maybe one one generation down, everything changes. It doesn't even look the same anymore. Mm. But the Romans, for some weird reason, these Romans had this dynasty that they were able to hold on to uh for romans it's very important uh to think that you have different you have thousands and thousands of different cultures to conquer yeah. and to uh it's it's hard to rule these people all these people i mean if you look at the roman empire it's it's really not that big in comparison with china with uh empire of, of, uh, of alexander the great right with Monga- mongolian empire but what is also important is the population density and you know today's france and the Spain, economy. italy the economy too yeah the economy i mean you can conquer the, because we tend to look at the maps today and say hey no this is how big the, the mongolian empire was but there is a lot of uh there's no man, all no yeah, man. No, no, no man land where no one lives. Right. It's pretty, pretty uh, easy to conquer this land or at least claim, hey, it's mine. Right, right. But uh, every single land that Roman Romans conquered had some kind of uh, inhabitants. Had its, king, had its own senators, had its own government. Like the Athen- yeah. Athens is a city state. They're within yeah. the Roman Empire, but they also have their own branch of government and everything. So yeah, like you said, it's very it's a lot more complicated, but I think what made them so successful was they were I think the I think the the number one hallmark of a successful empire is that they they care about public health, they they build aqueducts, but they also allow for their conquered subjects to 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 keep their culture intact. So the Egyptians, oh yeah, you guys like Osiris and Isis, keep them. You don't have to worship Jupiter. Who cares? Worship Isis and Osiris. Have fun with that. And even even the Jews, even Jerusalem. Yeah, keep your temple. Keep your sabbatical year. They did that. And there was only a few emperors like Caligula, Nero, Domitian, who really en- encroached on that. And their historical story reflects that. But all the other ones like Caesar and Augustus and, and Vespasian, after he sacked them, sort of let them be. Like, okay, you can do your own thing, you know? Yeah, that was the philosophy of the Roman Empire. We basically, do whatever you want, but maintain the, the Pax Romana, maintain the Roman peace. And if you like, stand up against us, oh, 
or even when you uh, want more rights, social war. Uh, first century BC, Etruscans are one of the many nations, uh, including Samnites. They rise up against Rome and say, hey, we want to become Roman citizens. We want, we want Roman citizenship. We want more rights. And it kind of shows how Etruscans descended, that is this pride nation that used to control Rome is suddenly now descended descended to a phase where they beg for Roman citizenship. They want to become Roman citizens. So they rise up against Rome. What happens? Uh, uh, I think Lucius Cornelius Sulla yeah. and start then sex Etruria. And what he did to Etruria was one of the worst uh, historical atrocities that that has ever happened because he sacked almost every Etruscan city and he destroyed so, so many, so many things that would now dwell in museums. But right. Sulla, Sulla was so obsessed with uh, destroying his enemies that Etruria was almost totally destroyed. The other guy who was also uh, pretty much responsible for destroying Etruria was Hannibal believe it or not. Right. Because Hannibal uh, sacked Etruria, it was one of the richest provinces of the Roman uh, and, well, Roman Republic. That's how he and kept he, his army going. Excuse me? That's how he kept his army going. He's, 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 he's traveling with his army from Carthage and they need, they need food, they need payment and look where he's at. He's in the middle of their territory. He's going to sack them, obviously. You know? Yeah, but... but Hannibal was a genius. Yeah, he was. And he knew that he needs uh, to sack only some places. So he said he sacked when he was in uh, Etruria, he sacked Etruria on purpose. He did not need to sack Etruria, but he knew how Etruria rich is, how how is Etruria rich, and he wanted Romans to to help them to to do something uh, irrational. Like march quickly against uh, against him. So of course, Roman consul marches against Hannibal uh, without any support, and he is de- defeated in the Lake Trasimene. Yeah. So this it's is true. how Hannibal Hannibal was a genius. So when when he is in southern Italy, southern Italy, he then starts to sack only uh, places of uh, non-government officials. So it looks like that. You know, to to divide Roman government and uh, Rome and plebeians, they I, I I destroy everything, but you know, not everything that belongs to the Roman consul, and that puts a really puts Roman consul in a, in, in a bad spotlight. Yeah, and um, so when Hannibal was so successful, and this is the last thing we'll talk about, and we'll close out. Hannibal was so successful in his military career. He he wreaks so much havoc on Italy and Rome that when when Scipio Africanus rose up against him and sort of miraculously finally defeats this genius military freak, well, they it's, it was such a big deal that they actually have mythologies written about Scipio, and it's um, Apian has it in his in his writings and other people too. But they're saying like there was a when, when Scipio was born, there was a star in the sky that signified a, a savior will be born. And so it, it, what does that remind you of? But what it shows you is this sort of thinking of the people of the Mediterranean world is like it's all everything's all destiny. And like people don't just people don't just beat Hannibal because of chance. They were chosen that way. It was supposed to be that way. And I think it tells you a lot about yeah. You know what I find, you know, the last thing I really want to mention about Hannibal yeah. is how every documentary you see with Hannibal, you know where it ends. It ends in uh, with the Battle of Cannae when he defeats Romans, one of the biggest disasters for the, for, for the Romans, 216 BC. Uh, he defeats Romans and there is not, then there is nothing. There's like, yeah, then 14 years pass by, and then bam, Hannibal is in Africa, and he's defeated by Scipio in Battle of Zama. 
Uh, there is uh, 14 years in between when Hannibal is in southern Italy. He might have spent more time in Italy yeah, than, than probably in Carthage and in Hispania. Uh, so he was just... I, this is just what baffled me. There was for 14 years he was just in in southern Italy. He was sacking, he was and sacking the place I'm, and I'm, no one talks about it. Yeah, no, you're no, you you really I really want to stress what you're saying here. Hannibal set up his garrisons and he would just sit there for years in the middle of a country that he's invading. Yeah. And he's fine. <laughs> like you never imagine, just imagine. I don't want to compare Hannibal to ISIS, but let's just for the for the sake of argument, let's do it. Imagine if ISIS was living in the middle of Texas in their own city. Yeah. And they just had a city, the city of ISIS. And there they were for 15 years just sitting there. And nobody can get in there and, and take them over. Yeah, yeah. That's what it was like. It's interesting because some, sometimes they, Romans, sometimes they did try to uh, defeat Hannibal after, yeah. after Battle of Cannae. But they were always defeated, always defeated. It was this small battles and suddenly both consuls were defeated by Hannibal and slain. Every like three or four years, Romans tried to defeat Hannibal in southern Italy with some small armies and Hannibal always repulsed them. Yeah. And that's why when Scipio became the savior, they even gave him that name, Soter. It's a Greek word. I mean, savior. When he when he did when he finally rose up and defeated Hannibal, it was such a big deal that they deified him. He became a god like after he died, obviously. Obviously, but when he died, you better believe it. He was a deity. Yeah. He was now somebody that you can pray to and offer sacrifice to. That's how big of a deal it was for someone to take down Hannibal. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, we covered a lot of ground. Um, this has always been fun when I we just get into these conversations about Rome and who knows where. Like, there's so much to talk about. There's so much we can do. I could do this yeah. for a hundred hours if I wanted to. But this is so typical of Etruscans. When you start talking about Etruscans, you will eventually uh, end up uh, talking about about Rome and about yeah. and because Etruscans have such a huge influence on anything around them. But it's, they are so mystical that we cannot keep talking about them for, for, for a long period of time because they had an influence on others, but they did not uh, leave much on, on, their, their, on their side. So they did not leave much uh, arch of, uh, you know, architecture and stuff. So this is why it's so hard to even write a book about Etruscans because you will eventually end up writing about Romans Greeks and believe it or not, Carthaginian, Carthaginians. Yeah. Yeah, I was able to pull up the legend of Scipio. And it says that. Go ahead. It's, yeah, it says that he was regarded as favored by Fortuna, the goddess, divinely inspired. Many believed not only that he had received the promise of help of Neptune in a dream on the night before his assault on Carthag Carthago Nova, but also that he had a close connection with Jupiter. He used to visit Jupiter's temple on the Capitol at night to commune, to talk with the god. And later, <laughs> he was a full-blown prophet in this story. But yeah, Polybius himself was a rationalist, probably underestimated the streak of a religious confidence. But although Polybius had an intense admirer, he we call almost most famous man of all time. So yeah, this is like the... He becomes the archetypal Roman savior. That, and every, everyone after him, Caesar, Pompey, Whoever they be, they would compare him to Scipio, hmm. and so that's he's the he's the real be, he's the first one to be the this Roman savior Soter. Yeah, the fun fact about uh, Carthago Nova, as you mentioned, the city uh, Carthage means a new city. So Carthago Nova means a new new city. Yeah, and guess what? Carthage from the real Carthage was. The new city of, I think, Tyre or, yeah. yeah, Sidon, Tyre, the Phoenicians, basically. Yeah, it's Tyre. That's what it was. It was the island of Tyre, and they were fleeing Nebuchadnezzar. So they fled Nebuchadnezzar, and they found Carthage. So Carthage is the new city, and then so then they found another new, new city. It's, yeah, that's so weird. 
Yeah, they were not very or- original with uh, name pickings. Right, right. It is. These are the places I would really like to visit one day. I'm in Tyrus, uh, Antioch. I would r- love to visit Antioch. It's in oh, today's yeah. Turkey. Yeah. Yeah. One I'm of going- the largest cities at a time. I'm going to Israel in October for a, like wow. for like two, two over almost two three weeks. I'm going to see Masada, that big mountain fortress. I'm going there. I'm going to the Qumran caves, the Dead Sea, um, the vineyard of uh, Jezebel. I'm going to see the tomb of John the Baptist, Mount Tabor, Jerusalem, the old city of David. I'm going underground to see Hezekiah's tunnel. I'm going with an ar- a, fa- uh, a trained archaeologist who's been there 72 times. Wow. So I, I have a whole we have a whole guide that's going to take us around. We're going to film and do vlogs. It's going to be great. Wow. Well, I'm going to watch that because I really I would love to visit Jerusalem was one day. Unfortunately, uh, in my uh, yeah with my with my health condition is is not that uh, desirable at the moment. But one time I will definitely go to Jerusalem. I really want to visit Israel so bad. Yeah, it really is like one of the one of the spots that people should go visit. That in Egypt, I think. Hmm. But you saw I, in, I was in Egypt actually, but then uh, in just you know a vacation, so uh, yeah, I didn't did not see anything. Oh, and by the way, anybody who's watching this, uh, Maximus Thomas has a channel. It's in the description. He visited Rome. He's got a lot of really good video vlogs of Rome, the city of Rome. And you guys check that out and uh, subscribe. Thanks. And uh, I think that wraps it up for now. Anything you want to promote? Anything you got coming up? Anything? Um, you know, influence on the, uh, the, the health influence has a huge take, has taken a huge uh, part of my life. So. Well, the only thing I want to say, just stay healthy, eat healthy, and, you know, be be grateful for what you have. Thank you. And you have just attained true gnosis. You have just attained true gnosis. The Demiurge has no power over you. Jesus.